Okay, folks, here we are. We're in chapter 34. The Atheism of the Early Church. Let's go. Chapter 34. The Atheism of the Early Church. Because we tend to project the present onto the past, we too often view the conflict of Rome with Christianity as a persecution of religion. As we have seen, Rome's concern was that all religions should be licit or licensed and controlled. As long as the religion was not subversive of Caesar's authority and power, Rome was only incidentally concerned with the content of the new religion. Christianity was charged with being an atheistic cult, and Rome hated atheism as a subversive force. The readiness of Rome to believe that Christians were guilty of incest and cannibalism was due to its conviction that atheists are capable of anything. Eusebius, in his Church History, Book 5, gives us an account of the persecution of Christians in Lyon. Earlier the Jews had been accused of atheism. Now the Christians were the main targets. Justin Martyr said that Christians were called atheists because they arrayed themselves in opposition to the demonic forces of their day and against its moral corruption. The Christians held the gods of the pagans to be wicked and impious demons. Justin added, quote, And we confess that we are atheists so far as gods of this sort are concerned, but not with respect to the most true God, the Father of righteousness and temperance and other virtues, who is free from all impurity. I dropped that last word in there. How are you getting on there? Are you all right? Are you all right there? You need my cup of tea? Okay, yeah. Who is free from all impurity? End quote. Justin spoke out sharply against the cynic Crescens, the cynic Crescens. Justin spoke out sharply against the cynic Crescens, who had accused the Christians of atheism. Quote, I do therefore expect to be plotted against and fixed to the stake by some of those I have named, or perhaps by Crescens, that lover of bravado and boasting, for the man is not worthy of the name of philosopher who publicly bears witness against us in matters which he does not understand, saying that the Christians are atheists and impious, and doing so to win favour with the deluded mob and to please them. For if the assaults, if he assaults us, come on, our martyr, bye. For if he assaults us without having read the teachings of Christ, he is thoroughly depraved, far worse than the illiterate, who often refrain from discussing or bearing false witness about matters they do not understand. Or if he has read them and does not understand the majesty that is in them, or understanding it acts thus that he may not be suspected. Suspected. Hello, this is Nathan. Thanks for joining me in the booth. I really hope you're enjoying the live streams and videos. To find out more about this narration project, or to make a donation, go to nathanteacher.com. Thanks. Acts thus that he may not be suspected of being such a Christian, he is far more base and thoroughly depraved, being conquered by illiberal and unreasonable opinion and fear. End quote. We have here two important points to pass over quickly. A cynic philosopher is the last one most people today would expect to accuse Christians of impiety and atheism. What did these terms mean to Crescens and to men of his day? Piety meant, above all else, a respectable submission 
to statist authority. A pious Roman was a man devoted to and obedient always to the Roman state. Christians felt that theirs was a truer and higher piety, but to Romans they were indeed impious, and to the Greeks as well. Clement of a... Clement of Alexandria sought to show that the only real Gnostic is the Christian who, quote, alone is truly pious, end quote, of the change of eth- on the charge of atheism. On the charge of atheism. Of the charge of atheism, he declared, quote, He then, who is persuaded that God is omnipotent and has learned the divine mysteries from his only begotten Son, how can he be an atheist, a theos? For he is an atheist who thinks that God does not exist, and he is superstitious who dreams that... who dreads. Better believe it, boy. It's a lot of that about, boy. And he is superstitious who dreads the demons who deifies all things, both wood and stone, and reduces to bondage spirit, and man who possesses the life of reason, end quote. Clement identifies atheism to give it a Christian content, which it did not previously have. What then was atheism to the Greeks and Romans? We find the key to this in Eusebius, as he gives us the record of an integra... <laughs> Mm. 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 Ah, shucks, man. Come on. We find the key to this. No, that's not good enough. Surely not. We find the key to this in Eusebius. No, that's not good enough. We find the key to this. We find the key to this in Eusebius, as he gives us the record of an interrogation by Emilianus, the deputy prefect of a group of Christians. One of the Christians, Dionysius, reported the matter in a letter to Herma- Hermamon. Hermanon. Hermanon. One of the Christians, Dionysius, reported the matter in a letter to Hermamos. Hermamon. Hermamon. One of the Christians, Dionysius, reported the matter in a letter to Hermamon. Quote, Dionysius... Faustus, Maximus, Marcellus, and Caramon. Caramon, that wasn't bad. Caramon. Dionysius, Faustus, Maximus, Marcellus, and Caramon being arranged. <laughs> Caramon. Marcellus and Caramon. Caramon, Marcellus and Caramon, being arraigned by Emilianus, the prefect, said, quote, I have reason verbally with you concerning the clemency with which our rulers have showed to... I have reasoned verbally with you concerning the clemency which our rulers have shown to you, for they have given you the opportunity to save yourselves if you will turn to that which is according to nature and worship the gods that preserve their empire and forget those that are contrary to nature. What then do you say to this? For I do not think that you will be ungrateful to their kind for their kind. <laughs> I do not think that you will be ungrateful for their kindness, since they would turn you to a better course. End quote. 
Dionysius replied, quote, Not all people worship all gods, but each one those whom he approves. We therefore reverence and worship the one God, the maker of all who hath given the empire to the divinely favoured and august Valerian the Galli- and G- Gallienus. to the divinely favoured and august Valerian and Galenius, and we pray to him continually for their empire that it may remain unshaken, end quote. Emilianus the prefect said to them, quote, But who forbids you to worship him if he is a god together with those who are gods by nature? For ye have been commanded to reverence the gods and the gods whom all know, end quote. Dionysius answered, We worship no other. Emilianus the prefect said to them, I see that you are at once ungrateful and insensible to the kindness of our sovereigns, wherefore ye shall not remain in this city, but ye shall be sent to a place called Sephro. For I have chosen this place at the command of our sovereigns, and it shall by no means be permitted you or any others, either to hold assemblies or to enter into the so-called cemeteries, But if anyone shall be seen without the place which I have commanded, or be found in any assembly, he will bring peril on himself, for suitable punishment shall not fail. Go, therefore, where ye have been ordered. End quote. End quote. We see here clearly the totalitarian mentality. Emilianus feels that he is being gracious in allowing the Christians to submit to his demands, and he calls them, quote, ungrateful, end quote, for persisting in their faith. More important, More important, Emilianus tells us what atheism meant to Rome. It was the refusal to worship the gods of nature, that is, natural forces. The Christian idea of God was, quote, contrary to nature, end quote, We come now to the focal point. For paganism, divinity was a power inherent in nature which manifested itself which manifested itself which manifested itself in great men, in heroes, but supremely in the state. In the state, men and the gods realized themselves A stateless man was no man at all, and a stateless god was a contradiction in terms. Power came into focus, came to focus. Not good enough. Power came to focus in the state, and the idea of a god divorced from and transcendental to the human order was anathema. All the pagan cults which infiltrated Rome, such as Mithraism, were cults in search of a state. Christianity, by declaring the triune God to be totally separate from the state and totally over it in authority, was atheistic. It was denying the state and its gods. Christianity made the triune God the source of all power, authority and legitimacy, whereas Rome maintained that it alone made the gods legitimate because power and authority belonged to Rome. Rome thus recognised the supernatural god of Christianity as the enemy of its foundations and its power. We have today a like conflict. The modern humanistic state, while not using the same term, regards Christians as in effect atheists because they believe in a supernatural god whom quote-unquote scientists regard as non-existent and a superstition. John Dewey, in A Common Faith, echoed Emilianus's Hmm. John Dewey, in A Common Faith, echoed Emilianus's hostility to Christianity as an enemy of a true naturalistic social order. The authority of the state as the ultimate natural order is undermined by the Christian faith. Crescens and others in the Roman Empire were not ignorant of the contents of the Bible. For them, 
The only moral force tenable for man was the fear of the state. If man were placed instead under the rule of a remote and unseen god, what would then restrain man from incest and cannibalism? So reasoned the Romans and Greeks. For them thus the church was the enemy of man, of social order, of the state, of morality, and of the gods. They called it atheism. Sorry about that. Alrighty. So there you go. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. That was, was that 34? Something like that. That's 34. So I hope to see you in 35, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5. See you soon. Okay, we're in chapter 35. Statism as a religious fact, one. So let's go, man. Chapter 35. Statism as a religious fact, one. Fox, in a study of pre-industrial India, noted that the kind of civil government existing then could not be described in terms of the contemporary concept of the state. Quote, Ari Freikenberg has noted that the Western concept of the state is not readily applicable to governmental forms in traditional India. The state in Western political theory enjoys a monopoly of coercive force in the society and is the centre of administrative decisions and judicial review. Freikenberg suggests that traditional politics in South Asia never controlled such centralised powers. Rather, administration, police and civil activities often were dispersed, sometimes resting with the virtually autonomous or independent local overlords, and at other times with kin groups or civil servants. End quote. The same, however, can be said of Europe prior to the French Revolution. In theory, the rulers claimed, quote, divine right, end quote, and absolute power. In practice, their powers were limited, and local units had a variety of independent powers. Although often their taxes did not reach the proportions exacted by the modern state, it can be said of the pre-revolutionary leaders that, on the whole, they taxed more than they ruled. In France, the many religious houses that is, monasteries with their extensive welfare and educational programmes, were suppressed. All sources of charity were seized by the state between 1789 and 1793. Much earlier, the German... Uh, Germanic. Germanic, Hispanic, Latinic... Much earlier, the Germanic kingdom not only was not a state, but according to Strayer, quote, was in some ways the complete antithesis of a modern state, end quote. It was based not on the state as an entity, but, quote, on loyalties to persons, not to abstract concepts or impersonal institutions, end quote. In short, quote, security came from family and neighbourhood and lord, not from the king, End quote. Even after the origin and development of the state, it was some time, largely since the French Revolution, that drafted and standing armies existed. Taxation was not organised with even the remote thoroughness of the 20th century. The state was essentially the personal court of a king and his associates. The development of the modern states is a religious and anti-Christian fact. Strayer's commitment is especially important. Quote, a state exists chiefly in the hearts and minds of its people if they do not believe it is there. No logical exercise will bring it to life. End quote. It is important to understand this shift from the more basic governments of family, community and church to the state the shift was a religious one. 
Ralph summarized it clearly as it came into intellectual focus in the Renaissance. Quote, Together with other thinkers of the age, Erasmus, Moore and Machiavelli, shared a conviction that, without any change in human nature or any drastic altering of institutions, the political order be made to serve desirable human ends, end quote. As Hellenic thought was revived, the pagan doctrine of the state was reintroduced into European thought. The Reformation and Counter-Reformation set back this paganism for a time, but after 1660 it was again increasingly dominant. With the Enlightenment it was in obvious power. Mergler said of Western Christianity, quote, After it had struggled, also, but still very thoroughly, at enormous moral, social and political expense to make man and his world endurable, the Enlightenment suddenly and with great pathos presented it with the claim that the natural man, Rousseau, and even the Jew, Blessing, and the savage, Sueme, Sueme, And the savage, Sueme, Sueme, and the savage, Sueme, were better men, in other words, were better men. Sueme, were better men. In other words, that the thousand year old exertions of Western Christianity had brought about a merely negative result. End quote. In brief, Christianity was increasingly held to be the hindrance to the good life, not the means to it, and the state sought to place a distance between itself and Christianity. Previously, in medieval Europe and the Reformation, Christian man was seen as a necessary unit for a good society. Now he was the impediment. It is ironic that this idea of the secular state is so popular in many evangelical circles because it denies that conversion is necessary before a man and his society can become morally sound. The modern states popularised slogans which had as their purpose the erosion of non-statist governments and the enhancement of state power. Max Beloff is called... Let's go. No, no, no. Max Meloff called attention to this with respect to Austria at the time of the French Revolution. Quote, Both liberty and equality were devices by which the state could be strengthened. If Jews and Protestants were to be freed from persecution and encouraged to come into Austria, it might be possible to rival the economic success which toleration was believed to have brought to Prussia. If the serf could be freed and allowed to choose his occupation, Industry would acquire new sources of labour. Equality meant the breaking down of the groupings and orders into which the social and legal order was divided, so that all citizens should be equally subordinate to a strengthened bureauc subordinate to bureaucracy. What humiliation! Ghastly. So that all citizens. Mm, no, no, it's not what we want. so that all citizens should be equally subordinate to a strengthened bureaucracy and equally tributary to the royal treasury. End quote. Thus, the modern state worked first to free men from church, family and local rulers and customs in order to strengthen itself at their expense. And then, having accomplished this, it began to strengthen itself against individuals who are now without their traditional coverings and institutions. How radical this destruction of the ancient Christian governments was is apparent when we look at what happened to Benedictine monasteries. Long a source of welfare and more, of almost 1,500 in 1789, only about 30 remained in 1814, and these had fewer men and were despoiled of their assets. 
The French Revolution had in 1789 proclaimed a Declaration of Rights, but it then proceeded to trample all rights underfoot as no previous regime had ever done. Equality, fraternity, the rights of the people, liberty, land to the people, bread and more have been revolutionary slogans which have led to the denial of precisely their affirmations. In the 1790s, quote, the two great weapons of the modern state, end quote, conscription, born in France, and the income tax made in Britain, were created. Oh, I want to cry. I didn't know that. Oh, dear Lord, mercy. In the Ancien Régime, the states claimed to total power were still in... Where's the states? The states claimed to total power were still in embryonic form and in trifling ways of etiquette. Thus, when Louis XIV's meals passed by in the Hall of Versailles, it was customary to raise one's hat to salute and sweep the ground with its feathers. After the French Revolution, the totalitarianism was more substantial. The state began to make itself coterminous with society, which meant controlling or suppressing all other powers and governments in society. The roots of this went back to the 13th century, when final decisions concerning social objectives began to be made by civil governments. The church was held to be increasingly, quote, merely a private society with no public powers or duties, end quote. Leadership had passed from the church to the state, the goal of the state in the old pagan and platonic dream of a monopoly of power Ugh, is 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 yeah is yeah the goal of the state is the old pagan and platonic dream of a monopoly of power by its claim to sovereignty and to universal jurisdiction over everything within its domain the modern state seeks indeed to be a god walking on earth. The biblical faith in a multiplicity of governments is in in it. No, in. Oh, nuts. The biblical faith in a multiplicity of governments under God is denied. The self-government of the individual and the governments of the family, church, school, vocation and society are all subverted in favour of the unitary power of the state. Let us consider again Strayer's comments. Quote, a state exists chiefly in the hearts and minds of its people. If they do not believe it is there, no logical exercise will bring it to life. End quote. The modern state is faltering badly. In the United States, it is said that the percentage of eligible voters who vote has been dropping in presidential elections since Woodrow Wilson's day. The modern state is, quote, a god that failed, end quote. When Christians again see the total crown rights of Christ the King, the threat of the state will collapse. Come on! Alrighty. Hope it didn't bust your eardrums. Good. That was good, good, good. Okay, guys. I shall see you, hopefully, on chapter 36. Okay, chapter 36. Let's go. Chapter 36. Statism as a religion. Ah. Chapter 36 Statism as a Religious Fact 2 As we have seen, the state is a religious entity. Joseph R. Strayer stated that, quote, A state exists chiefly in the hearts and minds of its people. If they do not believe it is there, no logical exercise will bring it to life. End quote. 
Why should a given state have given boundaries? Is it race which describes the state? The United States is clearly not of a given race, if we can use that word. France includes a variety of peoples, and Britain is made up of Gaels and English in a not-too-harmonious union. Is it language? In the United States, besides Indian tongues, we have Spanish as an official language of New Mexico and a variety of Europeans and Asiatics clinging to their mother tongues. In France, the Bretons prefer their language to French, and Great Britain has its Gaelic-speaking minorities. Why, if language and race are important, should not Germany include East and West Germany, Austria and other territories, or the United States include Canada and France, much of Switzerland and so on? National boundaries are artificial lines, not God-given realities which have a natural inevitability about them. Yeah. All righty. Don't want to open a portal. National boundaries are artificial lines, not God-given realities which have a natural inevitability about them. Moreover, the state cannot be identified with government. It is one form of government among many, the main forms being the self-government of the individual man, the family, the church, the school, vocations, society, and then civil government. Within each of these spheres, there are many varieties of governments. Thus, within the world of commerce, there is the government of the stock and commodity markets, Here, oral contracts made and made without witnesses are regularly kept, although five minutes after a telephone call, a change in the price of a commodity can cost a man large sums of money. Still, the contract is kept. Customary law has long ruled in many societies. In some parts of the United States, as in the Ozarks, some religious groups restricted marriage and divorce to the church and refused to recognize any valid rule for the state. This was still true as late as the 1950s. This does not mean that these varying forms of government necessarily give good governments. To say that, to, to say so. To say so would be to fail, fail. Fill into, fill into, fill into. To say so would be to fall into the same fallacy as statism, namely the belief that some institution can give good government to bad men. Each, at least in its own sphere, gave some checks and balances against the others. The U.S. Constitution includes a checks and balances element in its three branches, executive, legislative, and administrative. These, however, function only when the federal government was small and one variety of government among many. Now, all three branches are an essential union against all rival forms of government, the individual, the family, church, school, vocation, and society. The states now claims to be the government. The state now claims to be the government, a radically false claim. This is not all. The state is no longer content to be that form of government which is a ministry of justice under God. It claims to be the overlord or god of society. It seeks to subordinate all other jurisdictions under its own, as though the state represents disinterested benevolence and is hence the proper judge over all. Where many governments exist, the corruption of one is not necessarily the corruption of all. Where statism triumphs, the small corruptions are replaced by the massive corruption of the state, an evil which permeates all of society. The issue with regard to the state is thus a religious one. 
evil is a problem for all of society. The corruption of sin affects a person and all his institutions. The family is God-ordained, but sin can turn the family into hell. Recently a boy murdered his father. The father had forced his mother into prostitution, repeatedly raped his daughters and assaulted his son. He had forced drugs and pornography on all his children. The family in the hands of such a man is clearly an evil place. So too are church, state and school in the hands of reprobates. The idea that the state can be the overlord and moral arbiter between men, other governments and institutions is one of history's most evil illusions. It is a religious illusion which seeks to circumvent the need for God. Its ancient classic is Plato's Republic. Its current expression is the modern state. At issue is whether or not the key governing unit on earth is the redeemed man in Christ or the state as God walking on the earth. Behind this is the basic lishab. Basic issue. Behind this is the basic issue. Does sin have its only true cure in Christ or in the state? How is the good life possible for men? Can the state provide justice without Christ and his law word? Or is the logical end of the state, like unregenerate men, to be a hell on earth? We must affirm that the individual, the church, the state and all other forms of government can only manifest original sin, the will to be their own God, Genesis 3.5, apart from Jesus Christ. There can be and needs to be a disestablishment of the church, but there cannot be a separation of religion and the state. It is only a question of which religion shall prevail. The modern state is anti-Christian in origin, conception and administration. Earlier we saw the implications of Marsilius of Padua's thought. Walter Ullman in The Individual and Society in the Middle Ages called attention to the humanistic foundations of the state in Marsilius and others and as developed by the state. Laws were held to be valid laws by consent by means of this doctrine, the law of God was not proper law because its subjects gave no consent. Sovereignty was transferred from God to the people when lawmaking was given to man. Instead of power and sovereignty coming from God alone, it was now held to come from man below. Whatever the natural inequality of men within this sphere of civil government, all men were held by Marsilius to be without disjunction. 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 Mm, 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 mm. To be without distinction. Marsilius also placed control of the church in the hands of men, as E. A. Gortner. 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 That'll do. Mm, that'll do. Mm, 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 mm. In the hands of men. As E. A. Gortner in Peter and Caesar pointed out, Church and states were thus both under man, not Christ. Even more control of the clergy was given to the state so that the natural order might predominate over the supernatural. The church, in fact, was viewed as a human institution. Marsilius's position was a political averroism. 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 Marsilius's position was a political averroism. Aristotle's humanistic state had been revived and Marsilius was a professed Aristotelian. He was a man whose thinking made Christianity at least irrelevant, if not a nuisance. We cannot, however, see Marsilius as the inspiration to Machiavelli, Erasmus, Moore, Hobbes and others. Altogether, were part of a shift from Christianity to humanism, from God to man, and from redeemed man to natural man. The thinking of Marci the thinking Marsilius represented Marsilius
The thinking Marsilius represented was current in his age. The revival of Hellenic thoughts meant that priority was given to the natural order. In time, the supernatural receded to a minor role and then it was denied. George Grote, 1794-1871, the English historian, educator and politician, wrote his many-volume History of Greece, a work which gave devout attention to all the details of Greek culture and history. Turner described Grote's attitude as a, quote, vendetta against modes of human association other than the ties of citizenship, end quote. His view of society was of essentially atomistic individuals under the state. He saw family relationships as pernicious to the body politic, and he looked for, quote, a new genesis of the man and the citizen, end quote, under democracy, which for him was, quote, a vehicle for moral transformation, end quote. The Victorians believed that the ancient Greeks had a natural virtue which provided for a good society. Matthew Arnold and others saw Greek humanism as man's hope. English education for its elite students was mainly in Greek and Latin and studiously irrelevant to the modern world in order to be relevant to its humanistic faith. The state was seen as man's hope and salvation. The variety of secret societies in Britain and America were dedicated to this faith, dedicated to this faith, this faith. Mm, 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 mm. The state was seen as man's hope and salvation. <laughs> The variety of secret societies in Britain and America were dedicated to this faith. Man, by his own efforts through the states, can remake man and society. The consequences have been the wars and politics of the 20th century, man's darkest age. Dear Lord of mercy. All right, that was chapter 36. You might be interested to know that the next chapter is chapter 37. I hope to see you there. Okay, here we go. We'd like good luck. Uh, we're in chapter 37 of Christianity and the State. Let's go. Chapter 37. Statism as a religious fact. 3. The modern states is in continuity with Plato's Republic and Aristotle's politics. In Plato's Republic, there are no laws, only philosopher kings whose sovereign planning constitutes the source of all law. It is necessary in the perspective of Hellenic thought for elite men to rule because, quote, chance and accidents legislate everything for us and it is necessary to assert the reign of reason. In Plato's perspective, quote-unquote, God is on the level of chance and accidents as the blind unreason of being. Quote-unquote, guardians are needed to control men in society. Justice does not come from God, but from reason. God does not reveal a law. Virtue itself is a rational, is rational. Virtue itself Virtue itself. Virtue, 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 baby. Virtue, baby. Virtue itself is rational order. It is this perspective which subverted the medieval era and the modern world. Since law does not come from God, neither does sovereignty and government. Given the growing medieval respect for Greek thought, the natural order was seen as the determinative, determinative. The natural order was seen as the determinative order. The natural order was seen as the determinative order, and the great natural order is the state. 
The government and predestination of man was transferred from God to man. In England, King Henry II in the Constitutions of Clarendon asserted his quote-unquote rights over the church. The Constitutions, 1164, extended the already existing civil power over the church even further. Against this, Thomas Becket asserted the freedom of the church. For him, the basic issues were, first, the inviolability of church property, second, canonical elections to high offices in the church, that is, with minimal royal interference, third, freedom for churchmen to leave the country at will, to obey a summons from the Pope, to consult the Pope, or carry appeals to him, fourth, freedom to fill vacancies promptly, fifth, control of church property and church jurisdiction by the bishops, sixth, free entry of papal legates into the country, seventh, recognition by the king of papal authority over the whole church in England, and eighth, freedom from interference and control by the barons. Two years later, in 1166, Henry II issued the Aziz of Clarendon, which contained the first civil legislation on heresy since Rome's era. It was the state which demanded uniformity and subservience, both of the church and all individuals. Winston noted, quote, The very language of the Assize testified to the general state of lawlessness and to a tendency to institute tyrannical rule. End quote. The state, then as now, is more interested in power and control than in peace and freedom. The state, however, had in its favour the growing humanism of society, which the revival of Greek and Roman thought greatly furthered. The Renaissance was the culmination, 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 the culmination, the culmination. The Renaissance was the culmination of the decline of late medieval thought and life. Petrarch summed up the new outlook with a motto he adopted from Terence, quote, I am a man, and nothing human do I consider alien to myself. End quote. Humane, humane, humane. Humane letters now replace theology as the true basis of knowledge and history. Classical history was, quote, put forward as an instrument for the renovation or salvation of society, end quote. It was the revival of classicism which led Erasmus in February 1517 to write about his expectations soon of a golden age. Ever since, the dream of a golden age by human planning has become more and more prominent in Western thought. State projects are seen as major steps towards a humanistic utopia. Slum clearance in recent years has been seen as salvation in terms of this faith. Robert B. In terms of the... Hang on, there we go. In terms of this faith, Robert Weaver, former administrator of the U.S. Housing and Home Finance Agency, once said that, with slum clearance and the work of social agencies, quote, miracles can be accomplished, end quote, in the lives of families. Peter Morris, an English, quote, social scientist, end quote, observed, quote, in Robert Weaver's words, what is to be accomplished is not the recreation of a way of life, without rats, dirt and overcrowding, but a miracle, a shock of enlightenment which, like a religious conversion, transforms a person overnight, end quote. Change is to occur by quote-unquote revolution, state conducted or otherwise, according to humanism. Franz Fanon appealed to violence as society's hope. He saw violence as, quote, an assertion of meaning rather than an act of destruction, end quote. What Fanon said plainly, legislators hold to implicitly, and social legislation in the modern era is increasingly designed to do violence to society. Lawmaking by the humanistic state is a form of warfare.
Lawmaking by the humanistic state is a form of warfare against man and society. As Owen Chadwick pointed out, quote, Society is impossible without law, end quote. When lawmaking passed into the hands of the state, secularization began, quote, The Reformation made all secular life into a vocation. The Reformation made all secular life into a vocation of God. It was like a baptism of the secular world. End quote. However, because lawmaking became all the more a state function, the Reformation and the Counter Reformation were undermined. In the Enlightenment, the humanistic philosophers triumphed. Philosophies. <laughs> In the Enlightenment, the humanistic philosophies triumphed and humanistic secularization proceeded. While the Enlightenment affected the leaders of society, the humanistic secularization affected the many. This secularism meant a radically this worldly approach. Determination is by man within history, not by God. On November the 16th, 1879. 1879. On November the 16th, 1878, the Conservative deputy Comte de Moon, speaking to the Paris Chamber of Deputies, said, quote, The revolution puts the human reason as sovereign in place of the law of God. From this flows all the rest, especially the pride and rebellion which is a source of the modern state. The state has taken over everything. The state has become your God. End quote. Such a state cannot tolerate anything with a will or a government of its own. This was stated plainly by a Republican anti-clerical in France in the 1880s. Quote, anything with a strong moral life has a will of its own. Anything with a will of its own embarrasses governments. End quote. From the days of Tertullian to the present, the strong moral life of faithful Christians and churches has been no condemnation of them to earnest, no commendation. Faithful Christians and churches has been no commendation, has been no. Dig that, boom. Moral life of faithful Christians and churches has been no commendation of them to earnest statists. A strong moral unit of men creates a strong centre of strength and government apart from the state. There is thus a hostility to the moral element and an indulgence of the immoral. For Hegel, the kings of yesterday, and for the bureaucratic... and for the bureaucracies of today, quote, the state's highest duty is to perpetuate itself, end quote. Because the state sees itself as the overlord for all within the territory of the state, it grows increasingly intolerant of any divergent element, especially one which insists on a transcendental order. The true Christian must insist on the crown rights of Christ the King. He believes in God's law, he recognises the necessity of obeying and pleasing God, not man, and he moves in terms of his calling from God. He has what the modern state detests, a dual citizenship in the local state and in the kingdom of God. In that dual citizenship, God's kingdom has priority and must govern over the local realm. There is thus a state of war between modern civil orders and Christ's kingdom. Those who refuse to recognise that war will become the first victims of it. How do you like me now? Alrighty, peoples. Uh, look forward to seeing you on chapter 38. See you soon. Bye.
Well done for listening right to the end. If you would like to know more about this important Christian audiobook project, please go to nathanteacher.com. Thanks.